So, my name is Chris Thorne. I'm uh, working company called GMRX, which is literally two minutes walk away from here. We're at City House, just the uh, past the, uh, the station. Uh, we work on uh, graphics for games primarily. So, what I'm going to talk about are the, the challenges we see in real time graphics for the next five years, which essentially means the next console cycle. The sort of things we're going to start seeing on Xbox One, PlayStation 4 uh, over, the, uh, over the next five years. I guess given my location, I should really just talk about Xbox One. Other consoles are available. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I put the word photorealism into, my, into the title here. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky term and it kind of means different things to different people. So it's generally it's a good idea just to find out what I mean. I don't, by photorealism for games, I don't mean that we want to make things look like reality. That's actually a bit dull. That's not why people play games. We want to make the games look like movies. So we don't really want photorealism in terms of reality. We want the games to look as good as a live action feature film. Not an animated film, a real live action film. That's where we're trying to get to with some of the, uh, the games that we're going to be looking at. Now, uh, and it also talks about sort of solved and, and, and open challenges. Now, if you're making a movie and you're bringing lots of CGI to it, even though it's a live action film, there's a whole ton of offline tricks that people can use. People, you know, movies just spend ridiculous amounts of compute resource. You may spend sort of 24, 48 hours on a, on a render farm just on one frame of your movie. And with all of these tricks of compute, uh, compute power available to you, I'm going to tell you, for the purposes of this talk, that for the movies, getting photorealistic CGI is essentially a solved problem, and ha probably has been for a good 10, 15 years. Um, the, all of the interesting research now is in getting the same level of effects in real time. And you can, you can see the, this if you, if you go to an event like SIGGRAPH, which is the main graphics conference um, for uh, the community. Ten years ago, the real time was a sort of tiny fraction of, uh, of a SIGGRAPH um, uh, timetable. Now, most of the talks are all about achieving effects in, in real time. So the, the challenges for photorealism for us are, can we do it in-game? Uh, so I'm going to show a movie of one of the, uh, one of the new releases, it's one that we've been involved in, just to show you what the current state of the art is. For, uh, for graphics in games. Uh, this is a screenshot from it. This is uh, Battlefield 4, which is due out in the next few weeks. Uh, and this sort of level of quality is quite typical of what a lot of high engines, uh, sort of high, high quality game engines can deliver these days. There are aspects of it that are uncannily good and really close to photorealism. And there are aspects that don't work quite so well. Uh, and you'll see that in the, in the movie. Uh, no sound. All right, it sounds like that. Um, okay, so this is the uh, I think it's the latest TV trailer for Battlefield Four, uh, and well, yeah, it's also fighting. Uh, anyone here play Battlefield? Oh, I'm actually quite a few people. Right? <laughs> uh, so this is a game we've been working on with the, the team at Dice for a couple of years now. Uh, the guys at Dice were actually the very first company to license our software, and we've been working with them for over four years now. Uh, and our, our lighting software is now a key part of the Frostbite engine. So all all EA titles that come out on Frostbite uh, are linked using part of our technology. Uh, and the main point I want to get across here uh, is yeah, there are definitely uncannily good moments here. Uh, and there, there are also there are little fragments where it still looks like, uh, looks like a game. Uh, and that's kind of the, the challenge that we're, we're faced with now. Uh, you know, how, how do we... Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what we can do now. How do we just make it that bit better so everything kind of comes together? Uh, and I'm going to talk 
you know, in detail on some of the main challenges uh, that, we, that we see. And indeed, yeah, the, the team that does has done an amazing job with that care, but I think you can see that the, the amount of progress we've made over the last five years is, is quite astonishing. Now, I'll get my talk back. Three specific challenges: um, hardware, uh, uh, lighting, and, and global illumination, uh, which is our sort of main area of expertise. Uh, the material systems and, and shaders, which is how you actually make each element of the surface, each pixel on the screen, look bright. And uh, and some additional <laughs> uh, uh, and some additional research that we got. <laughs> So I'm going to I'm going to just fire up my uh, <laughs> my Windows PC. <laughs> uh, which may take a little while, but at least it works. <laughs> and, uh, I'll, I'll carry on talking about this for a little bit. <laughs> uh, okay, so lighting, uh, absolutely key part of any graphic system. And we have seen just an incredible uh, improvement in quality of lighting over the over the sort of five years this last console cycle. Uh, and one of the key key things that's happened is that middleware companies like I'm um, sprung up that actually specialise in lighting. This didn't exist five years ago. Five years ago, pretty much the only areas where specialist technology companies existed were in in physics companies like Havoc and in animation companies like Natural Motion. Uh, and they, they both, both grew on this from a previous console cycle. This console cycle, we've seen a growth in more specialist companies, and lighting has become one of the sort of key areas. Uh, there's a whole range of, uh, of new techniques that have been developed over the last, last five years. Light mapping was kind of developed in the last console cycle, but really got a lot better uh, this console cycle. Uh, shadow mapping got an awful lot better. Uh, techniques for making the sun look good have got better, but actually still probably aren't good enough. Screen space ambient occlusion, uh, and then there's some more, more interesting new research topics, uh, particularly what sort of code tracing coming out of, of NVIDIA. Um, right, so uh, we will talk about, talk about lighting. So what, what's, uh, what's been a particular problem that we've solved? Well, we decided to tackle what's called global illumination. This is, in a sense, all of the bounce lighting in the world. Um, on the sort of last console cycle, we kind of cracked the problem of how to shine a light onto an object, cast a shadow, and you could light a game level by just having loads and loads of these, what are called direct lights, all over the place. It gives you a slightly weird look, it's not remotely realistic, it, and it's, it's kind of the, the, the look of games like Doom and Quake. Um, but what goes on in the real world is like hits a surface and it bounces off onto another surface, another surface, and go around multiple times before eventually it comes and comes to the back to the receiver and back in the camera. And then that multiple bouncing around was the problem that, uh, that we decided to solve. So here's a couple of screenshots from our, actually from our mobile demo. Uh, a typical direct lighting renderer would return the image on the top left. The only light source in that image is the sun and only the things that are in, are in direct sunlight get lit. We then could be all of the bounce light, so we take this stuff that the surface has been lit by the direct light sources, bounce all of the lighting around to fill in all of the, the subtle detail, and then finally on the GPU, just composite the two images together, and you get something that looks you know, like it's lit properly. And this is all done fully uh, dynamically at runtime. And uh, the uh, at the start of the last console cycle, this time of real-time radiosity was viewed as you know, almost you know, unthinkable, extremely hard. <coughs> now, these screenshots are actually taken from us running on an iPad, and we can run on pretty much any mobile device all the way up to um, you know, the next generation consoles. So that's now a solved problem. Uh, and I think some of the architectural decisions that we made on Enlightened will actually become more and more standard in the, in the industry over this next console cycle because it's just been proven to, to work. 
Um, this separation of direct and indirect lighting paths is crucial to making lighting work for lots of different reasons. Um, it gives you, it's, it's much more flexible, it gives you some control over the quality so you can decide how much resolution you need in the bounce light. Uh, and it gives you a lot, of, a lot of opportunities to make use of the various different resources you have uh, on, on the console. So the direct lighting, for example, will always be done on the GPU. In lighting can be run on either the GPU or the CPU, or, or it's a mixture of the two. Uh, the second decision we made is there's an upfront pre-processing step for all of the large scale geometry in the world. If you don't do this, if you try to compute all of the lighting fully dynamically without any sort of previous knowledge of what things can see other things, <coughs> you really then do have a horribly complicated problem uh, and you're just wasting a huge amount of effort co computing at runtime a whole bunch of information that you could have computed offline. So there's this upfront step uh, which we use essentially to comp compress down loss of visibility data and that makes the whole run, the actual code run efficiently at runtime. And that means you have to separate the world into the static and dynamic objects, but actually this is something that most game developers are completely happy with. When you create a level, generally there are some parts of the level of the world that are viewed as static and just not going to move, some parts are, are dynamic and physics objects you interact with, and there may be elements that you can destroy. And that, those type of decisions tend to be made up front as part of game design. Uh, so we employ this mixed CPU GPU solution, which really enables you to squeeze an awful lot of performance out of the uh, out of the um, consoles, in particular, anything with a mixed with a unified memory architecture. Uh, and the question you sort of often get at uh, uh, the graphics events: you know, can you do what Enlighten does using some of these new techniques? It's fully real-time techniques like real-time ray tracing or voxel code tracing. And the answer is no. Those techniques, they're, they're nice for SIGGRAPH papers, utterly hopeless actually trying to run them in a game. If you look at a sort of SIGGRAPH paper on the technique like, say, Voxel Contra, you see that they've actually hold the entire CPU and GPU resource to get some, some graphics out that kind of look okay in a small, defined world, but then you take it to a world, you know, like a battlefield format, so, you know, five miles across, and try to do that in real time, and have a game running, running underneath that's holding most of your resource and a whole lot of other stuff you want the renderers to do and you find these techniques just, just can't even get close. So we think these type of architectural decisions are, are, are appropriate. Uh, another decision we, uh, we made in London was to, to use standard data structures that the graphics industry uh, knows and understands. Uh, the main one we use is, is light maps. So light maps are a very good way of storing the lighting information in a, in a virtual world in textures. And then you put these light maps onto the surfaces uh, in the same way that you put, put textures onto surfaces. What we do with Enlighten is we keep the same idea, but we update those light maps dynamically. So as far as the renderer is concerned, it's just putting a light map onto the surface. You don't actually have to change any of, the, or, of your rendering code. All that's happening is under the hood, Enlighten is dynamically updating these light maps as the lighting conditions change. That turns out to be a really good way to, uh, for, to work with developers. Uh, and another sort of <coughs> technique that's now become pretty well established in, in the industry is, um, as, as you like characters, you've got the separation of dynamic and static objects in the world, uh, and the dynamic objects need to pick up the lighting information from the environment, and the way they do that is you store information locally in probes, uh, I must admit, my background is, is, is in physics. Uh, I was 15 years in the uh, radio astronomy group here. I was a little bit startled to come into the graphics industry and find that these things are referred to as storing spherical harmonic data, which I thought, well, that's interesting. I, I'm used to spherical harmonic data for things like the cosmic microwave background. I know you can have sort of thousands of, uh, of coefficients in, uh, in there. And then to find out that actually they store four. So really, there's just an open scalar and a vector term. That's pretty much all we do. But that's surprisingly good. You've got these dense enough, those four numbers can actually give you a really nice effect of a character walking through a scene and being lit in a very realistic way. Uh, another nice feature of working with the surface data is uh, things called area lights are sort of free in Enlightened with some caveats that I'll come back to in a second. Uh, any, any surface can be made 
to glow and illuminate the rest of the world. And if you're running in light in the background, adding in a new glowing surface is a free, free of top. It, it doesn't actually have any, any effect. It was used a really good effect in a game called Quantum Conundrum that came out last year where they lit the entire world with area lights, actually sort of hidden surfaces that could change color. Uh, and the, the, the whole game dynamic was based around um, seeds being sort of re in various different ways depending on uh, what dimension you're in. Uh, it's a really nice game actually. It uh, didn't, didn't sell particularly well, but it's really good. So that, those are, that's kind of the, the, the solved part of the puzzle. We can do good global illumination now. We take the upfront hit of pre-processing some of the static geometry. We do the separation of static and dynamic objects. And then we put everything together in the end at runtime. So what, what are the, sort of the key lighting challenges that we see going forward? Um, and there is still an awful lot. There's an awful lot of work needs to be done to get to film quality lighting in games. The first one I highlight, shadows. These are still actually a bit of a problem, and particularly directional <laughs> lights, things like the sun. Getting really good shadows from the sun in real time is, is a tough problem. And the main problem is if you're in a large city, and the sun, say, has some vaguely oblique angle, there could be a mountain or skyscraper way off in the distance that's casting a shadow directly into the bit of, lap of area that you're walking around. And if you've got some, uh, some shadow map that's got some fixed resolution off the distance, you're going to see enormous pixels on the ground where you're walking around. Uh, and the, the technique that was developed over the last console cycle to solve the problem was called, was called cascade shadow mapping, which is kind of okay, but doesn't really cut it, uh, and it has lots of issues, um, very fiddly to get it, get it working right in the game. Uh, there are possibly better alternatives. You might actually, this might be one of the occasions where real-time ray tracing becomes feasible <coughs> in the game. You can just about think about ray, ray tracing for every pixel on the screen back to the sun to see if you hit it. But even that's quite expensive and you'd like to do something a bit better. Shadows are a huge challenge on mobile platforms where you don't have the same power available. Uh, you can see quite a few of the demos out there, uh, or there's lots, lots of mobile demos out there. We, we do a lot of work on mobile platforms at the moment, and you just don't have the same amount of memory and the same amount of resource to play with. Uh, a second really interesting problem, uh, and this is one that some, of the, some developers are really starting to tackle now, are the, the light types. So currently in games, we really have three light types. Point light, which is the light bulb, a spotlight, which just sort of shines down, uh, and the sun, a directional light. And that's kind of it. Uh, but in the real world, uh, in film, they have a far, far uh, vaster array of um, uh, lighting, uh, lighting modes, which we'll come on to in a second. Uh, another lighting challenge, something that uh, we've been doing a lot of research on recently in collaboration with ARM, is getting deferred lighting, which is a way of getting loads and loads of lights into the world in real time getting that working on mobile platforms, which again is a hard problem because you're limited by bandwidth on mobile. It's very hard to move data around on, off and on the chip because that has a big power hit. So what we've been doing quite a lot of work on is if we can keep the memory on the chip, uh, can we do a proper deferred lighting solution? And we've, we're making some good inroads into that. So, this is what I mean by the, the difference between what a cinematographer would use and what currently exists in games. Cinematographer can get a vast catalogues of lights like this, and they can use the light to see in any way they like. I say, in game, we currently have four light types. Three light types, sorry. Four in the area lights. Uh, so, what developers are starting to do is uh, actually use the, these type of film lights uh, using a standard called the <coughs> IES for the Illuminated Engineering Society, I think, standard, uh, and actually using that data to light the world. And that gives you some much more interesting effects. And we're just beginning to see that on this generation. Uh, and I do have, this is quite a good movie to show. This is one from Epic. Uh, Epic have put a lot of work into uh, their dynamic direct lighting. Uh, and let me see if I can persuade this video to play.
Right, I'll stop it after a bit. Um, one of the, the, the interesting things they did here was they, all of the different lights you can see all along there are these IES standard types. So you can really, the artists can really go to town with how they lit um, this, this world. Uh, and the, the overall result is, is really good. I mean, this, this is astonishing, astonishingly good work from that thing. Uh, it, there's, yeah, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a game, so they're putting all, all of the effort here is onto the, the on-screen graphics. Um, it does show you that you can actually get really quite close to movie quality uh, uh, animation in the, with, with a real-time engine. <coughs> um, they've also put an awful lot of work into their material system that I'll talk a bit about as well. Right. There you go. Watch the rest of that. Too violent. <laughs> uh, area lights. So this, to, to my mind, is one of the big outstanding challenges, big open problem that anyone here wants to go off and do real time graphics research. I really encourage them to look at this. Um, in film, in particular, cinematographers like to make heavy use of area lights. Area lights uh, give you a really nice effect, they give nice soft shadows off everything. And you know, it's a lot of film sets are specifically designed to take, take advantage of this. <coughs> what we tended to do in games up till now, to, to fake an area light, is you cast a spotlight onto a scene, get a, get a shadow map from that, which is basically, our, am I in light or not, and then filter it, blur it a bit, so it looks a bit soft around the edges. Uh, <coughs> and that looks kind of okay, it, it works in some circumstances, but it's not really getting us close to what, uh, what a cinematographer could do. What we'd really like to be able to do is just position area lights in the world, move them around dynamically, and have them look right. Uh, <coughs> we, we did quite a lot of research on this over a couple of years ago to see if we could achieve this on the last generation Xbox 360 PS3 cycle. And we, we could get close, but really we, we were just maxing out the GPU performance. Um, it's something that I think you can start to see happening on this console cycle. And if you give artists the ability to move area lights around uh, and just set up their lighting fully dynamically with area lights everywhere, you're going to get to see some really interesting uh, effects. Uh, th these, these are just sort of couple of screenshots to show what I'm talking about in real life. <coughs> that, I mean, that would just be hell to try and do in real time. Uh, that top level. All those, there's hundreds of different area lights there. And even a scene like this is quite hard to do because you've got this large light source. Um, but, you know, the area lights are ubiquitous in the world and we, we need to sort of make more progress with this problem. Uh, if, you, if you can work offline, ray tracing is probably good enough, uh, but it's very hard to see, the, see whether you can actually cast enough rays completely dynamically so that if a character walks through there, they cast the right shadow from those area lights. So we, we, need, um, we need more sophisticated techniques than that. Uh, some of the other challenges, that this is kind of the, our company's challenges for the next few years. Uh, interacting dynamic geometry, so as dynamic objects move through the scene, we need to do be a better job of calculating how the light bounces off them back into the world. We like to have store more directional information <coughs> at surfaces. That spherical harmonic thing, those just scalar and vector terms, we're going to start finding that just isn't good enough. Uh, as we want to like more complicated characters and bring in more interesting lighting effects. And there's a whole lot of interesting stuff which we'll come on to next on how we look at materials. So, this is the part where I actually get to talk about a tiny bit of physics. Uh, physically based shading, this is the big hot topic in games graphics at the moment. Uh, you're interested in it, there's some really good courses out there. There's a very good course of SIGGRAPH this year where, where uh, we almost start plagiarizing the images. Um, so what happens in the real world when light hits uh, a surface? Generally, two things. Either the light bounces off, it's spectral reflection, or it goes through a series of internal reflections and then comes back out in a much more diffuse pattern. Now, what Enlightened does is it solves assuming all of the bounce writing is diffuse, uh, which turns out to be a good enough approximation for a lot of global illumination. 
But what we're often really interested in is the specular effects you get, particularly from direct light sources, and they are a lot harder to do well. Uh, this is the sort of separation. The, what you tend to do is you ignore the, uh, the sort of distance in the scattering. You assume everything just comes in and bounces off and diffuse, like as you want to, and then you separate out this specular term. And we try to model that in a different way. The information in this specular term is stored in something called a bidirectional reflectance distribution function, which is this F thing here. It's the thing that you integrate the incoming light with a BRDF, and that gives you the outgoing light in a particular direction. So it's a function of potential position on the surface, but really it's a function of an incoming direction and outgoing direction, so four variables. These have been measured pretty well for lots of materials, but in games we just don't have good ways of applying complicated BRDFs uh, to, uh, to surfaces. And we're just beginning to solve that problem now. Uh, over the last console cycle, we really didn't do much at all here. Uh, so a lot of surfaces are diffuse, that's what it does. Or we use a Fong model which just takes a dot product and raises it to a power, which can look okay in some cases, but tends to make things look a little bit plasticky. And there's a couple of extensions to that. They have no physical basis, we use them because they're really cheap to do on the GPU. What you actually want to do is solve the physics inherent in this type of problem. Well, so why do surfaces bounce off in different directions? Well, they have this sort of micro facet behavior. Um, so you need to try to model that and then kind of aggregate over the, the surface behavior. Uh, real BRDFs have this reciprocity uh, property that goes back to Helmholtz uh, that says that it, should be, that it basically should be a symmetric function of its input and output direction. Most of the, the BRDFs that we play around with don't actually obey this. Another one, Another thing that's quite a good idea to get in is energy conservation, or at least energy, you, the, the, the OBRF can't create energy, but actually we often use ones that do, that kind of look okay. Uh, and isotropy, most of the BRDFs we use so far are isotropic, but interesting materials like aluminium tend to be anisotropic. Dielectrics, I said to be a little bit of physics in here, is your uh, re reflections formula for parallel and perpendicular waves incident at a uh, surface. Uh, these have interesting effects as you go to shallow grazing angle where everything becomes very reflective and the total reflection coefficient goes up to one, to sort of Fresnel behavior. We're only now beginning to model this in, uh, in games. So it's actually a practical application of electromagnetism in games, which is nice to see. Uh, the method was even harder, uh, and we need, a, we need a series of new techniques to take care of the fact that they ref have a total reflection. But they still have interesting color properties, interesting spectral properties at different angles. Uh, and what, what's just starting to happen now is most of the main developers are starting to hone in on a set of parameters that look like they're going to become a standard for the next few years. Uh, some standard parameters for surface properties and a set of fairly standard models underneath that that apply on your GPU. Uh, the base color, then the level of how metallic something is, how shiny it is. Uh, a, a roughness parameter, which when you actually <coughs> go through and do some proper physical modeling can be given a very clear, sort of robust meaning. And then another cavity parameter, which is how much of small scale shadowing there is. With these four parameters, uh, you can give them to artists as sliders, and they can generally now start to come up with pretty much any material type that you like. And the, and the shade, the corresponding shades that run in real time are fast enough. Uh, the other trick you use is you then layer these on top of each other with, uh, with a mask to tell you where your bits underneath come through. So these images are all taken from Unreal Engine 4's material system from the SuperApp presentation. I think you'd agree these are looking yeah, pretty stunning in terms of that level of realism. The, the downside is they look brilliant uh, and they run fast but that's a heck of a lot of work for an artist to author, and that's kind of the other big challenge we have. Uh, so the, sort of the holy grail here is a shader, or a set of shaders that are computationally cheap, so they can run in real time. Uh, they can make lots of use of lookup textures, that's, that's fine, that tends to be a pretty cheap operation. They need to embody some sense of correct physics, um, and 
bearing in mind that whenever game developers talk about physics, they mean it in the loosest possible sense. Uh, it should interact with all, of the, with all of the lighting correctly, including QMAX, which captures all of the, the lighting environment. And it should respond to both direct and indirect lighting. There's no point putting a whole load of effort into a beautiful shader if the moment your character walks out of direct light into indirect light, you don't see any of it. And the fo focus now is uh, sort of honing in on these four, on the sort of simplified model with four parameters. If you talk to guys in the film industry, they have more complicated models. They tend to use sort of eight, ten parameters. Uh, but we, I think most developers now think these four are, are, are good enough, and then multiple it, layering them up. That still leaves a whole bunch of unsolved problems. Cloth doesn't really look that great in games at the moment. We don't have good solutions to that. Hair, because there's a very good reason why almost everyone wears a helmet in a gag. It's because <laughs> yeah, it's just still really tough. Um, the final thing, sorry, I'm slightly overstepping my time here. The, the last sort of area where people really like to see uh, some progress in, in lighting and graphics is in participating media. Uh, these are just some, some, some random images. Uh, these two black and white ones are from a couple of film noir films where you can see that the director and cinematographer have really gone to town with the amount of smoke in the, in the scene and then the backlighting on it. It gives you these really interesting effects, but that's really hard to do in real time. Now, volumetric lighting actually you know, can, can contain a whole vast array of problems. Uh, scattering, partial absorption, frequency dependence, and so on and so on. Uh, any, any one of these could be the entire SIGGRAPH section. Uh, I think last time I was at SIGGRAPH, I sat through an entire afternoon of talks on rendering milk. Uh, <laughs> it turns out milk's actually really complicated. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and yeah, the, these, any one of these are having so talk. Currently, what we're doing is we have a whole series of hacks for each of these, and you kind of layer them on top of each other uh, to see if you can get stuff that works. Uh, so some of these work really well. I think actually the atmospheres is a kind of fairly well solved problem. It's fairly easy to do. Uh, they're fairly, they're well understood models for how colours change in the distance. So yes, top images from Battlefield 4. The, in terms of the sort of distance stuff, I think that's looking really good. And um, the bottom images from Grand Theft Auto 5. You can actually go on the web. Uh, so it's a kind of bizarre thing for GTA players to do. You'd think they're just going to go in there and start shooting people up from over there. Right. But there's, there's a whole um, there's a whole subculture of people who just go around the world and take these beauty shots of it and then upload them. And there's some quite stunning images that come out from, uh, from Grand Theft Auto as well. And a lot of them were, a lot of the details gone into getting this at the atmosphere pretty good. So I view that as kind of a solved problem. And there are other sort of box of tricks that are sort of semi-solved problems. Um, God rays are uh, fairly easy to do. They're probably overdone in some games now. Um, more and more these days, we're looking for more interesting factors, for more like lens flare. Uh, and uh, snow blizzards are actually can be done quite well as well. Has anyone here played The Last of Us? Did you get through to near the end with the blizzard thing in it? Well, if you haven't played it, well worth, well worth playing through at that level, it's, uh, it's really well done. Um, but there's a huge amount of open problems. Uh, I've just put a sort of random image up here to see, show how a film cinematographer would like to combine smoke, different light types, just to create a single image. We, we just can't get to that level at the moment. Uh, and the things we're lacking, uh, first of all, control. It's, it's fine doing full screen effects like the atmosphere, but what an artist would really like to be able to do is control where the smoke is to create just the right look, and then have that smoke interact with physical objects as you move through them. That's really hard. And we also want the, these atmospherics to interact with the, the local light sources and with the, local global, uh, with the global illumination correctly. That, again, is very hard. You probably do need to use some sort of voxel approach here which immediately means you're getting into uh, quite expensive effects because voxels are in cubes as opposed to surface techniques like in that are in square. Uh, and there are, there are other interesting effects that, that we really don't do a very good job of taking care of. Some of them are uh, probably just impossible. You know, the, the way the eye responds differently indoors and outdoors is something that's sort of hardwired to our brain. And trying to get that, to work on, that effect to work on a screen so that as you walk, from an indoor scene to an outdoor scene, and then locally adjust the color grading so it kind of works, it's really hard to replicate, really hard effect to get right. 
Okay, I'm definitely out of time now, more than out of time actually, so I haven't even had time to discuss a whole heap of other interesting research topics. Uh, if you're looking at sort of film quality, then things like motion blur, depth of field, anti-aliasing all become very important. Um, anti-aliasing is an interesting one because at the start of console cycle, everyone goes like, we must have anti-aliasing in my game. Uh, it's going to become sort of a compliance requirement. Microsoft and Sony both said that last time around. And then actually, you kind of get the end and you tend not to bother. Not that big a deal, uh, but it is something that kind of subtly differentiates uh, film from, from games. Uh, these other effects, motion blur, depth of field, are, are interesting ones because it's not totally clear that you actually want them in your game. If you want your game to look more like a film, you probably do want to put some depth of field in and some motion blur. But actually some films are kind of going the other way, uh, particularly things like The Hobbit where they went for a 60 frames a second. Uh, and then, of course, all the critics said, well, it doesn't look like a film, it looks like a game now. But maybe that's not such a bad thing. Um, <laughs> Subsurface scattering. Uh, it's another interesting thing. It's very important for getting uh, skin looking good. Probably is going to be important for getting hair looking good as well. A whole load of other stuff. Animation is a big, 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 big deal. I think if you go back and think of that, the Battlefield 4 trailer, a lot of the images look, look, you know, really quite compelling now. But it's I don't think animation is really quite at that same level of photorealism yet. The motions just aren't quite as smooth as high quality. I think. A lot more work is going to be done on that. And, and the final, final problem, the one I haven't, haven't tried to talk about at all, is already a big issue on next generation game development. How on earth do you also want this detail? It's really great if you can, if you can have a large, large sort of metal object and you can render all of the, the rust and all the rivets and everything, and we can actually render that in real time, that's great. But if it takes an artist a year to author it, you're not going to get a game made. And this is actually going to become the biggest challenge now. That's going to put a lot more of the emphasis on techniques that are procedural in how they generate their geometry and how they generate their textures. Uh, a lot of a lot more work's got to go into making the tools as easy as possible, and then making all of that play together in the final game. Okay, I'll stop there. To work with procedural texturing tools, so we worked with the guys at Alec Rizmic to make sure everything works together there. Uh, and we're also developing a lot of a lot of automated tools so that this setup stage uh, just becomes something that's automatic in the background. So there's a lot of geometry simplification has to go on. We're, we're making all of that automated. Um, but one one of the big the big challenges for us for NetGen is that there's going to be an awful lot of games made where they're going to be looking for large amounts of user-generated content. So we need to work well with users just, just making their own worlds. That means sort of having a sort of modular approach to this pre-processing step uh, and getting our, our tools in the point where developers can then expose them in the game without you requiring you know, three years of, of experience on Maximize to actually create an asset. Yep. Sorry. Yep, on the back. Uh, so uh, I was interested in your global elimination techniques. Uh, are, are most of these techniques in-house at Geomerics, or did you actually end up using some of the pre-computer radiant transfer literature that uh, came out of SIGGRAPH? Um, well, we, obviously we, we read the papers, right. um, but uh, we, we pretty much came up with everything uh, in-house. Um, did those turn out to be too expensive? To yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. <laughs> This is kind of a familiar experience for game developers. They go along to SIGGRAPH, they get really excited, come back with a whole pile of papers, go through and implement them all, and find that actually the authors haven't been totally honest about 
the performance and the corner cases and the scalability. Uh, yes, we, we got burned on that a couple of times, but in the end, we, we, we kind of knew the area we were going after, and you know, we, we did play into most things, but ultimately, we, we figured out for ourselves what, what was going to work. Uh, David, you're using a kind of finite element for PBS or something like that? Uh, what, for Enlighten? Yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's all, all surface based, and yeah, the, 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 the key part of it is, is taking the large scale visibility data and really aggressively compressing that down into a data structure that you can just churn through at, at runtime. Sure, but that visibility data is for a finite element on the surface? Uh, yeah, sort of, yeah. <coughs> Right. Okay. Does it concern you that you only capture diffuse effects? Uh, you know, going forwards, it seems like for all of this physically based advanced material stuff. I mean, the specular here for now, this is all quite important, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's what we do a lot of a lot of work on. We we uh, what one of the the sort of tricks that works is what whilst you bounce the lighting around in a diffuse manner, we do have directional information at the surface. And what you can then do is then add that, add a specular term on top using that directional information. And that gives you a really nice effect where all of the, all of the specular highlights are still maintained when you're out of the direct light and just an indirect light. And that actually works surprisingly well and is quite cheap. Um, so we, we, we're taking the, the, the same approach that uh, the game developers do. We're not going to try and rewrite everything to come up with some massive uber shader that will just do everything in one go. You have to pick your fights and then you start layering on effects as, as you need them. And there's, there's going to be a range of effects that are only available to next generation consoles and high-end PCs, and you scale back for current gen and, and mobile. Uh, any more questions? Oh, more, yep. Um, as a lighting artist, one of the uh, current pieces of the puzzle that I find most frustrating is still needing key maps because they're fundamentally just not a very next-gen technique. Um, one of the things I find most frustrating is that in theory you need them to be sampled from so many different places, otherwise the mechanical groups the dark corner of the room are still reflecting as if they're in the wrong corner. Have you got any thoughts on how to solve key maps? Because I really dislike them. Uh, <laughs> yes, it, it's uh, it, it's a big topic of our research at the moment, and we are uh, actually this in this release we're rolling out some new technology for how you interpolate Q maps. Um, well, one of the things we can do to make it easier is we can automate the process of placing Q maps, so the artist doesn't have to worry about them so much. That actually is quite a big help. Um, but yeah, there are there are issues around interpolation. As you say, it doesn't work quite the way you'd like. Um, but then, you know, if you were in a single room, you, you may actually just be able to get away with one cube map for the room, uh, and then some additional information that comes from Enlighten itself will tell you whether you're sort of in and out of, uh, will tell you sort of a global setting for the amount of illumination there. So you, we, we want to use cube maps just as a way of putting some real fine detail back in, and then use Enlighten for the sort of the more global aspect of, of what's the overall lighting level. Right, thank you.